Well, welcome to another episode of the Rock Fantasy Files. This episode has been put together by uh, with a lot of help from John McAtee, of course, from Incantation. He's going to be kind of hosting this along with me tonight. We're going to be talking about Celtic Frost. We've asked the panelists tonight. Uh, we have a lot of special guests tonight uh, to just mention their favorite a uh, couple songs from Celtic Frost, some memories, and I have a couple questions for our very special guest. Welcome, Reed St. Mark, to the show. Reed, good to see you again. Hell yeah. And we've got Alex in here from Incantation tonight. Uh, we got Immolation? Sam. Alex from Immolation? <laughs> he was at Incantation. Incantation this was, was a long time ago. This now. was uh, yeah, 10 years ago, you'd be right. Cut me off already, and I'm, I'm not even drinking tonight. Maybe I'm, <laughs> I'm going to throw, I'm going to give John the, the wheels, the bus, and John's going to introduce everybody and get this thing going tonight. Okay, well, um, okay, I'm John, and uh, for Incantation, um, then we have, uh, is it Jared, and uh, you did sound for a Trypticon, and what was the band again? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I play in a band currently called Polka Morte, and uh, engineer Everybody can go to our to trip to con thirteen forty nine and touring and studio produced a bunch of records and that's kind of what I do. Sounds awesome. Um, then we have Sammy from Goat Whore. Um, we have Robin from Gruesome and what you're the manager to the stars, right? I guess that's what. Yes, she uh, is. <laughs> yeah, uh, Denny uh, from Aggression, uh, the Canadian legend. Uh, then we have Chris Allo, which is uh, you know the man himself and. Uh, Will Carroll, Death Angel drummer. Uh, welcome, all you guys. Great to be here uh, with all you guys. Great to share this uh, time with Reed St. Mark, somebody who is, um, man, massively inspirational to all of us and pff, almost everybody that plays death metal, black metal, or thrash, or, or whatever. So it's totally an honor to have you here, um, you know, Reed. I we totally appreciate it. Uh, so very kind. I'm honored to join all of you. Well, th thank you so much. Um, I'll just try to make a, a quick little intro. If you don't know Celtic Frost, you're you're probably know nothing about metal because I mean the impact that they made in the uh, '80s is just you know just out of line. I mean, basically the heaviest band ever. Also did some you know off the wall stuff that you wouldn't expect. Um, you know uh, what even even like a kind of a heavy metal poser album kind of thing or whatever. Just a, a, a totally, um, you know, a, a band that you just, it's, al it's almost like, I don't know how to explain it. I'm sorry. Just, it's just something that's really, really uh, means a lot to me musically. Some, a band that's pretty much influenced almost everything that I've done, and I'm sure everybody else. And we, we said that we're not going to do too much of just talking about ourselves and how much it, uh, Celtic Frost has impacted us because everybody every band like i said has been impacted by celtic frost and uh whatnot and basically i guess we'll just start this off um let's see who who do i want to pick to go first i think um mm -hmm. i think denny would be a great person to go with for some right. old school uh celtic frost stories or questions i do have some old school celtic frost story man <laughs> um i guess like reed and i go way back but i haven't seen like I met Reed actually when they played the Celtic Frost played the World War Three in Montreal. I was the one who like picked them up at the airport, and I'm the one who dropped them off at the airport. They pretty much, I think you guys, you guys spent like about a week in Montreal, uh, you know. And um, every time Celtic Frost used to come around, like uh, '85, '86, uh, Aggression uh, and Voivod were often uh, playing concert with those guys, so we got to know them really well. Uh, the um, the funny thing about that airport pickup. So um, what was that? Mirabel, you know, like, Mirabel. Yeah, Mirabel Airport. You're right. Um, the funny thing about this pickup is I used to have like morbid tales, and you know, like you look at the back of the cover and you see like Tom Warrior looking like a six foot seven like freaking beast, right? And you like all looking like all evil and everything. So. So I picked pick these guys up at the airport. And so Tom Warrior, I see Tom first and he's like maybe like five foot seven or, or and I'm like six foot three and a huge Canadian guy, right? So 
I think he was more scared of me than I was scared of him. And he had this little like uh, jacket with flowers and like very European looking kind of guy. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? Right. <laughs> Then you had Martin. Martin was still very young. He still have like, 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 you know, like acne problems and all that. He was like maybe like 18, 19 at the time. And then Reed, like super good looking guy from New York, who's like totally like, you know, like all muscular and like, you know, like <laughs> not fitting at all, like from a look perspective with like Tom and, and, and Martin. So, so anyway, we, we, we picked these guys up and uh, uh, what followed up was like a, a week of like intense party, of course, like destruction was there, possessed was there, uh, Voivod and, and a nasty savage. and at some point uh you know like uh and they they uh they came to our jam space and uh me and reed started to talk about like uh hey do you want to do like some like we were just gonna like start jamming and we 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 jammed some of some of the most obscure song you guys can think of reed and i played some jean-luc Ponty like new country uh like which is like very obscure like prog stuff wow. we played some frank zappa and then we started to play some like celtic prog but with like a variation of like that so like, we would have like chair on vocals me on guitar read on drums and then you would have like uh, um uh, jeff from, from possess on bass and we just did like a a rotation of like jam for the entire night um anyway it's like You know, like, and, and I, I've never spoke to Reed since, like, that time. I, I tried to meet him once at a Mindfunk show in New York City, but I, I tried to uh, to go meet him and just didn't connect. Um, but it was a magical time. And um, Celtic Frost were a big deal for us because, like, you know, uh, when Morbid Tales came out, we already knew about Celtic Frost because of Hellhammer and all that. Um, but Reed made an impression on us for multiple reasons. Um The first one is he was playing drums with like gigantic like drumsticks. His drumsticks always been like super huge, and he was hitting his drums like to the point where like, like <laughs> the the drums looked that they were like being destroyed under him. And like you, he actually like we had to like get like multiple snare drums ready for 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 the concert. He used to like break the actual rims and like the skins and go through all that stuff. And my drummer, uh, Gate, at the time. Um, I remember and Gate. Reed, yeah, and him and Reed like, really connected. And uh, Gates, uh, Gates' uncle used to work for Air Canada, airline up here. And he was a, a machinist. And he, he'd actually made Reed even bigger drumstick. He, he took like two, and then they, they give it to him as a gift. Uh, and then he started to use them. Um, he started to, here you go. So, so yeah, Gates' uncle made these drumsticks, and we gave that uh, we gave them to Reed. Um, so yeah, like lots of connections. Uh, aggression used to cover like Celtic Frost. We used to play Detron Emperor. We used to play uh, To the Crypts of Rays. We used to play Circle of the Tyrants. Uh, so when they came to to town and we started to jam all of us together, it was very easy to uh, to play these songs. Uh, Reed, still one of my favorite like metal drummer uh that guy's a beast um anyway i could go on and on and talk so so long about that we so much so many things happen um aside reed being extremely popular with the ladies and tom and martin not so much so like even the the guys in aggression we had to like help tom and martin recruit uh groupies who wanted, who wanted to hang out with them Uh, which we did successfully, but it was, you know, it was, uh, it was fun. It was a fun environment. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but like uh, favorite songs to me, uh, my favorite Celtic Frost song is always going to be To the Crypts of Rays. Um, I don't know, that Morbid Tales, the EP was was really good. And I even liked it better when Reed was playing drum, which is, uh, I think it was, Steve Warrior on the uh, on the uh, Morbid Tales, um, and then uh, my favorite other song is uh, Into the Crypts of uh, Sorry, uh, Dethrone Emperor uh, off like that uh, Circle of the Tyrants EP, um, Emperor Emperor Return. Um, so that's it, Reed. Nice to see you, man. Glad to hear. Great. Well, memories. Thank you. 
And yeah. greetings to Gate if you see him, please. And unfortunately, he passed away in 2008. Oh. Um, but like, yeah, he always, always, always remembered that time and always that very high uh, praise for your playing and you as a person. So wow. awesome times. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Oh, you're on mute, John. Yeah, I can't oh. hear John. Fuck. Hello? Can you hear me now? No? It's too low? Nothing? I can hear you. I got you. Okay. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say, um, what do you remember from the World War III Fest read? Well, if anything, I, it's a long time ago, I know. The Oh, I remember it like it was yesterday, uh, oh. November 30th, 85. Uh, the crowd outside of the Palladium. Uh, nothing prepared me for the mass of humanity because we had played shows in Europe to a few hundred people at a time, 300, 700, 500 small gigs around Germany, you know, kind of our backyard. And to see the Palladium just packed, uh, it was a little bit overwhelming and the graciousness of all the people there from top to bottom. Uh, Maurice Richard, Johnny Hart, who yeah. were involved with Red Uh They couldn't have been more gracious and wonderful. It was just a wonderful time. And then later, of course, you know, we had the band had some hard feelings uh, toward destruction before I joined the band. I guess label mates, but there was some hard feeling. I don't know the background. And we buried the hatchet with destruction on stage at the Mustache Club a few days after yeah. the World War III Fest. And that was very significant to see Tom and Schmier hugging on stage. <laughs> that was a big deal. Wow. That's awesome. That's definitely awesome. Big. Yeah. Okay. Um, next, we'll go with uh, Chris Allo. Cool. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, hey, Reed, how's it going? First off, uh, a pleasure to speak with you again. Uh, I just hung up with uh, Pete Pardo from <laughs> Sea of Tranquility, and um, he told me to say hi uh, to you. And In fact, Pete introduced me to you a whole bunch of times uh, when you would be at rock shows at the Chance of Poughkeepsie. Yeah, sure. So I used to, used to see you uh, up there all the time, I guess, when you were out, out here, uh, you know, living out this way. But, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, pleasure to speak with you again. Uh, big Frost fan. Uh, yeah, Frost, uh, super important uh, band to me. I, I was lucky even, you know, before the world collapse, I, I had to see uh, uh, Trypticon in Philadelphia. And uh, then in, I flew to Vegas to see Tom do his, uh, his Hellhammer show. Uh, which wow. was something I never thought I would see. It was it was wow. on the sure. Um, but besides seeing Frost in the '80s, I guess my my only Frost story is uh, when they did the reunion in 2006. I got I was one of the press people invited to go down and, and hear the record and interview uh, uh, Tom and Martin. And uh, of the you know thousand rock interviews I've done, they were two of the absolute nicest and, and kindest guys I've, I've ever met. They signed all my stuff. And uh, uh, one thing, I, they were so nice, like so over the top nice. I've never done this before, but I actually brought a bootleg with me. I brought my, my bootleg Hellhammer CD. And what? they were, you know, most rock guys would be total dicks. Uh, like I know I, I love Danzig, but I could never pull out a, a bootleg Danzig, uh, a bootleg Misfits record. He hit, hit me over the head with it. But uh, I mean, they were so cool. They even signed my oh. my bootleg Hellhammer CD, and they were like, "Oh my God!" They're like, "Where did you get this from?" And I was like, "Oh, I got it from some some bootleg guy in Germany." Uh, but uh, but that that whole uh, reunion thing I thought was really cool. Uh, but that's I guess my 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 first question for you. Uh, Reed, is how come uh, you weren't involved with uh, with Frost in 2006? Why I was not? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I thought it was essentially my fault, but there was another element I've heard through the grapevine, how, how much veracity to that information remains to be seen. But I was struggling at, at when I was in, initially approached, I guess it was around 2002 with a possible reunion. Uh, a recording contract appeared out of nowhere and I was struggling with alcoholism and there was no way I was in any shape to do a project of any kind. I was barely holding it together, paying for my apartment, working, functional alcoholic. I couldn't just uproot myself and go and do this project. So 
I bowed out of it. But then as uh, apparently word has trickled back to me how much truth I do not know that Martin didn't want me for the project, Tom did. So whether that's fiction or not, I do not know, but I just recently learned of that from someone who has no ax to grind either way. So it's probably a, a hybrid of the two, but I will take the, I'll take the brunt of the blame for that one. Okay, fair enough. Uh, John, do I have time for for one yeah. more? Yeah, yeah. Right, well, uh, along along those same lines, um, there was talk of you um, working with Tom early on when he was doing the the Tripticon thing, um, and then I guess that didn't pan out. So, uh, you know, what happened there? Uh, nothing too much of note to share uh we did a few rehearsals and it didn't it just didn't gel uh nothing specific nothing i could really latch on to that would make this interview any more interesting it just didn't for one reason or another it just was not going to be there was nothing disastrous or dramatic yeah well sometimes better that way yeah mm -hmm. and, and it's unusual yeah that's cool. Usually musicians and actors and it ends with a bang. <laughs> yeah. Anything else, Chris? I, I was going to say, what, what did you think of uh, Monotheist, the record that they, uh, their reunion record? Brilliant. I thought. Uh, my, my favorite album is Morbid Tales, personally. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Very you, cool. Awesome. You still have time for one more if you want. Well, I, I just want to say I absolutely, I know this thing's all about, uh, about Frost, but I absolutely love uh, the first Mindfunk record. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. But yes. man, that album fucking kills. I actually just, you know, I bought it in the 90s, but then I, I, I found a record store that had the remastered version with the bonus track, so I just bought it again. Man, that record is amazing. You turn me loose and it'll be a two-hour show. Whoever <laughs> wants to do it, I got a lot to tell about that project. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just love that record. Thank you. We can circle back around in a few weeks if you want to talk about mine, Funk, at any time. Yeah, right? that'd be cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we'll, we'll pencil in the whole day. Um, <laughs> Maybe not the whole day, but hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, next, we'll go to Will Carroll. What's up, Reed? Um, Hey. We haven't ever met officially, but you were one of the first people to reach out to me after I got out of the hospital, and that meant the world to me. Uh, I oh, just wow. I wanted to say that right off the bat. Thank you so much. Right on. Um, I'm a huge Celtic Frost fan, but I'm even more a fan of your drumming. I think your drumming is the best part of Celtic Frost. And um, I love your double bass patterns. I try to rip you off as, as much as possible in Death Angel recordings. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just lo love the way uh, you, you uh, space your double bass patterns. Like you break it up. You go like dig it, 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 like that. Instead of just plowing through like uh, most other drummers would do. And I just wanted to ask, like, how did you come up with that technique? Or uh, yeah, how did you uh, figure that out? Uh, because I suck. I couldn't play sustained 16th notes and I had to give my feet a break. I'm telling you the truth. Wow. Well, you made it work in a brilliant way, man. <laughs> I didn't have much of a choice. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, my favorite songs are uh, Inner Sanctum. I love that track. It's, a, it's the most old school Celtic Frost song on that album, you know? Mm. And uh was that one of the later songs you tracked, or like, was that like an afterthought? Like we have to have a old sounding Celtic Frost song on a bizarre album? Oh no, not at all. That was in the regular rotation. Okay, great, Which kind great of track. Fit with that album because it was like a such an odd combination of songs and tracks. Mm -hmm. It was aptly titled. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love a uh, Jewel Throne. I love the hi hat beat you do. That it's fucking awesome, man. Like, how I, how how long does it take you to come up with a involved beat like that to just a basic like like you're doing the most right there, you know? Uh, I had to double the hi hat stroke and fit the bass drum on the second little thirty second note. That's the only yeah. way I could squeeze to squeeze the bass drum in the in the right spot at the temp the up tempo part, right? Yep. Oh no, no, the the the, the verses, the digits, digits, digits. You do it like a 
like an upbeat hi hat thing with slow double bass. It's fucking awesome, man. <laughs> oh, that was that was just laziness. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, honesty. And uh, my favorite song is "Circle of the Tyrants." Uh, it's just the most brutal. It's just the most brutal, especially the version on um, "To Make a Theory On." I think you're, the, the drums are awesome on that version, man. And uh, so I'm just curious, what did you think of like the albums like Cold Lake and Vanity Nemesis? Did you even check them out or? Uh, Cold Lake, no. Uh, Vanity Nemesis, I thought was very good. Totally. Very was heavy. Very, very good. Uh, Cold Lake, I just didn't listen to because the concept, I was afraid it was going to hurt my feelings a little bit. Mm. Uh, okay. Just you to know. see, I wasn't sure it was going to work musically. Right. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to stay away. There's nothing in there for me, likely. Right, right. How did you? How did you join Celtic Frost? How did you meet Tom Ward? Oh my God, I was playing with a rock band who was signed to. They might have been signed to to Noise actually, and they were going nowhere. And I was headed back. I was living in Zurich at the time. That's a whole other. Again, that's gonna be another two hour show, but. <laughs> I was going to head back to New York and I ran into the distributors of Noise Records in Zurich and they said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready to leave. What do you mean leave? I'm going back to New York. Well, listen, there's these two kids out in this countryside. You might want to talk to them. And it was a husband and wife. And the wife said, no, no, no. Reed's not a fit for those guys. And the guy, Alex, said, I think you should go talk to them. Go talk. Just go talk to them. So Martin was working in a record store in town. I went to talk with Martin. And uh, at the time I was living with Mia Giger, H.R. Giger's wife. I guess you all know the artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, I think you should give it a chance. So that's really how I got started. When I met Tom, I didn't know what to think. <laughs> I, he was skulking around the platform on the train. And we went up to his house and we talked. And uh, I wasn't sure... What was going on? Uh, I did see the paperwork that he did show me was so organized. I mean, he was 19. I guess Martin was 17. And I just remember Tom had a very clear vision of what he wanted to do. And I remember thinking, this is pretty ambitious for a 19-year-old in the Swiss countryside. Mm -hmm. And I had second thoughts. And Mia kept encouraging me to stick with it. And uh, I listened to Morbid Tales a lot, learning the material. And there was a sound in there, a depth, a, a dark depth. It was very hard for me to describe. And uh, there was something there. Little did cool, I know. Man. Yeah. Oh, on that topic, if I could interrupt for a second, you said that uh, Tom Warrior really had a vision when you met him. Through your time in the band, like, the vision, I mean, it seemed like the vision expanded quite a lot. I mean, how was that? I mean, um, you know, how was that being around? And did you notice that? And did you, how did you feel about the way that it kind of was moving as a band? I was too immature to appreciate the, the work value because he would compose an entire album's concept before writing the song. He'd have all the titles written. And the album concept and the artwork and the layout, even before he started writing the song. So it was almost like he was a master producer of a film. And he didn't hire the director yet. He didn't hire the actors. But here's the film he wanted to make. And he had a, an overreaching vision where I'm very, you know, micro. I have to play my drums a certain way. He was very macro. The guitars, the vocals, the lyrics, the concept, the meaning of the lyrics. So he saw the bigger picture. And I was too immature to embrace what he was doing. Did you, did you understand like where he was going, say after to Megatheron? Because I mean, you know, you had like um, what was it? Uh, Tragic Serenades, which had like a party mix on it, which was kind of a weird, weird thing to toss in the middle of that. But then it goes to I won't dance and. Um, you know, um, stuff like that. That just seems like it just, I just don't see where it fits in with that concept of a guy that is, you know, such big picture early on. Like what, what was your opinion on something like that? 
he had as many influences as he had as he exerted influence as an individual. So there were so many other types of music outside of metal that were influencing him at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think he wanted to incorporate, you know, I think he was listening to Jesse Johnson and he was listening to Bowie, which you can hear a little bit of influence in his vocals into the pandemonium. And a lot of the other more musical influences, I think he wanted us to stretch out, if you will. I think he felt confined by, you know, very formulaic black metal, death metal. And I think that's contributed. And I felt that he, well, he knew he had the power to exert that vision uh, outside of the normal channels. Yeah. Were you, were you comfortable with that? I was because the recordings I'd done before had gone so well. And when I joined the band, I knew nothing about metal. I did not play double bass drums at all. I had to learn on the job. I had very little experience. And in six weeks, I was recording to, you know, Emperor's Return. And yeah. the recordings came quickly. So I had, I had full confidence. Yeah. So things were just going so well. There was no reason to second guess any of those decisions. Right. Oh, okay. That's, that's fair enough. Uh, Will, anything else? Uh, no, just uh, I'm a huge fan and uh, I'm, I'm honored to be talking to you right now, man. It's awesome. It means a lot. Thank you. Awesome. Truly. Okay. Well, we can go with Alex next. Um, with a congratulations on your new child. Yes. Thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, I guess, uh, I mean, Celtic Frost is definitely probably one of my top five bands that, you know, it influenced me. So like John said earlier, we could all go on and on about <clears throat> uh, what Frost has meant to all of us. But, um, you know, I just want to mention to you, Reed, it's, uh, you, you've always been one of my favorite drummers. And uh, I've always kind of, um, you know, all the drummers I've played with over the years kind of just say, oh, you know, you need a little bit of more Reed St. Mark in there or something like that. And wow. They would, yeah, and true. they would understand that. Um, but, you know, my uh, question to you is, um, you know, because when I hear your, your drumming, it's kind of like, a, it's a mix of like jazz, you know, like solid rock drumming and kind of orchestrated, you know, and I think Will kind of touched on some of those things when he was talking about some of the things that you, you do to the songs. And as much as I think um, Steve Priestley did, you know, a great job on Morbid Pals, he's a very solid drummer. You brought things up to another level musically. And at that time, I don't think there was a lot of drummers that played that way, you know, in, in this kind of music, you know, in a more extreme metal. And I, so what, you know, I mean, what were some of the influences or, or was there a, something that you had in mind when you, you know, heard Frost for the first time, like, I could bring this to the band? Or was, was there something that, you know, you thought of musically that you could bring to bring them to another level? No, quite the contrary. I was just worried about surviving because I never played any of that kind of music before. The first track I heard was Into the Crypts of Rays. Yeah. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. The tempo, the drum beat. I, I think I could manage the drum part. So if I could just survive this song, maybe I can get through the first rehearsal slash audition. And uh, later on, you know, Tom really believed in me and he gave me the confidence you know, you mentioned jazz, rock, and classical. Those three are what I actually use. Uh, I studied classical music for years, and I wanted some of the drum parts to be more compositional to fit the songs, to give them a structure. Mm -hmm. But anytime I stretched out and did something out of the ordinary, Tom loved it. Instead of play it simple, I don't want I don't want to interfere with my song, or it's it's messing with the groove. Or he encouraged me and really gave me the confidence to develop. Yeah. Nice. He gave me some freedom, and it was just surprising because he's very controlling and particular. Yeah, and and you hear it too. I mean, you know, especially at the time, as much as I love bands like uh, Possessed and Destruction, you guys, there was there was something more real about it, and also, you know, lyrically, it was um, much more intelligent, you know, than just your typical Satan lyrics and things like that. And um, you know, and, and one other quick question I you know I have is. Uh, is into the pandemonium, which I, I consider that album to be genius. But at the, at the time, I bought that record the first day it came out. I was so excited. I went to the record store. I went down, 
and I put it on. It was me and my buddy, and uh, I remember Mexican radio coming on, and I didn't even get past the first song. <laughs> so it wasn't until a couple months later that, you know, I listened back to it. But you know, actually, at, at that time, I was all about the most extreme shit, and you're you're kind of, you know, your your brain's in a different place, you know, back then. So you're not as open minded about things. But then it wasn't until later that. I went back and listened to the record and, and just heard the genius of, of that album. And, um, you know, and, and I think uh, if you fast forward, you know, years later, so many bands kind of took that, that, yeah. you know, that idea and, and um, the orchestration did because, <clears throat> you know, Frost to me was not just a metal band. There's just, it's a much broader uh, musical spectrum to the band. And you know, you 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 could put Frost in with a lot of new wave music, a lot of kind of avant-garde stuff, Pink Floyd, things like that. You know, besides the heaviness of Sabbath and, and, and you know uh, Motorhead, maybe in, in, even in the band. But um, I guess I'll to get get to uh, three songs. So it's impossible for me to pick three, just three favorite Frost songs. Those first three records are like you know three of my favorite records ever. So I'll pick. Uh, one from each, and I'll have to say is um, a Crescent Oblivion from Into the Pandemonium. And I love the, the percussive thing I think that you're doing. It sounds like, you're, I don't know what you're doing. You're playing some kind of, uh, I don't know if it's- Mor It's a, a Moroccan doom back. Moroccan, yeah, yeah, mm. really cool, you know, and, and different for dark extreme metal. And uh, so I'll go with that. And then I'll have to say uh, Necromantical Screams. Uh, wow. That is just an epic tune, you know, it's just, perfection as far as I'm concerned I, I, and, the, and the drumming that you did on there too is like the orchestrated kind of parts and some of the on the like the, the chorus and things like that and then I have to go on uh Morbid Taz, the Front Emperor I mean it's just one of the heavy yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> I mean you know there's Tony Iommi and then you know there's Sabbath and then there's Frost you know as far <laughs> as the heaviest riffs ever written you know so but um yeah I just want to you know thank you for all the uh great music you made and, and uh, the influence you had on me. I'm a guitar player, but I always watch the drummers. So, um, you know, and, uh, it is, and you're it definitely is I, one, of the, you. one of my all time favorites up there with Ward and Ian Pace and all these guys. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> wow. So. Very kind of putting me with those, those stellar giants. It's oh. true though, for a lot of us, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, we, let's go with Jared next. Oh, all right. Hey, Rick. <laughs> Welcome. Hey. Um, wow, you know, um, I heard uh, Morbid Tales in about 1988, I think, probably a little bit late. I was super into punk rock music. And um, if you know anything about that history or whatever, the uh, it was giving away to some pretty weird stuff wasn't quite as aggressive or anything and a friend of mine played it for me and i heard into crips arrays for the first time um i was pretty much hooked that's i mean that's everything that was missing everything that had gone wrong in my opinion in the music i was listening to was there and i, I mean that's pretty much all i can say about that that's my favorite <laughs> cross song uh, i mean hands down um try to keep it semi-brief uh Frost stories. Um, well, I mean, mixing their Frost set in LA was pretty unreal, you know. And Albert standing behind me, jumping up and down, yelling. My drummer Clay standing next to me, screaming, dethroned in prayer. It was pretty <laughs> amazing. Hell yeah. Uh, and uh, as far as like working with the band, uh, the first time I met Tom, actually, it's pretty funny. I started a tour in 2010 with Triptychon and 3049. And uh, wow. basically I found a breakfast in a hotel in New York and I walked and I sat down and at my breakfast table was Raven Frost and Tom Warrior. And I was like, wow, so this is, I mean, I'm not real. I mean, I do a lot of work. <laughs> much care about a whole lot of people that play music on any other level than respect or friendship. But that was a pretty trippy breakfast, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I have a question, for you, and it's the same question I asked Tom, and it's a pretty heavy one. I asked Wino from St. Vitus this. Uh, I asked Paul Rosser from the Screamers this, and I enjoy this question a lot. And um, the answer is not 
egotistical. I just want you to be honest. At the time when you were doing it, did you understand? Did you have a glimmer? Did you have any idea that you were changing it? Changing what? Music. What the influence uh, carry for so long for so many people? Did you have any idea, any clue? N O. <laughs> That's pretty much what Tom said, basically. We were, we were so busy at the moment uh, uh, addressing challenges minute by minute. Uh, anyone who's been in a band or on the road or mixing stuff, you know, it's like minute by minute, there's a challenge, unexpected things pop up and you have to challenge, uh, meet the challenge of the unexpected. You know, you're you got a new bass player. Oh, she's pregnant. You know, there's so always something you're addressing. So you don't see the bigger picture. You don't see any potential impact. The only time sometimes when I would see some of the fans in the front row, the first 10 rows, I'd see the look in their eyes. And I realized the depth it was having on some people because I'm a music fan too. And when I go see people I admire, it just, it was, it was so, it was an emotional experience to see people I admire on stage performing a tune I knew. But apart from that, there were just so many things, you know, airline tickets and this and canceled hotels and the guitars got lost at the airport. So you don't realize what's happening. I didn't anyway. Actually, cool. that's the first time Trivicon did Maryland Dust Fest. Their uh, guitars did get lost at the airport. And Brian and I, the guitar, did do a $150 Uber ride to go find them at uh, Dulles actually to get them on stage the next day um but that's all i got it's really good to see you reed thanks for being here and everything thanks for playing thank you uh thank you thank you jared i appreciate it um okay let's go next with uh sammy sammy from goat whore how you doing reed <laughs> great how about you i am fantastic to be here talking to you my friend as a lot of people know in this stream thing know that I'm an enormous Celtic Frost fan. But I don't have a question for it. I have a statement for it. I just want to thank you for all the music that you created with Celtic Frost. Thank you. That's all I have for you. And I thank you for your loyalty. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I can relate to that. Um, yeah, oh, Robin, I guess you're next. Okay, Sammy, you don't want to say anything else about tour, nothing? No. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a feel free. You feel free to say something if you want feel to. Feel free Sammy. to jump in and say something. I, I I'll, try, I'll try to think of some funny Tom story. Okay. Yeah, do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, I mean, what has been said, I mean, except for and the age old question, and I'm going to probably get yelled at, but does it matter if it's Celtic or Celtic? Well, that's a good question. Well, if you go to the Celtic parts of England, of course, they say Celts. Americanized, it's Celtic. Both are correct. However, I did notice when I was in Scotland, where they use the word Celt and Celtic, they have a, a soccer team called Celtic Glasgow from Glasgow. So how does it work? Can, how do they have it both ways? Yeah, right. That's what, and what do, you, what do you personally prefer? Or it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I always said Celtic Frost because that's the way it was always said to me. Okay, by, yeah. Okay. By, by, Tom, by Tom and Martin. And it oh. sort of took on a life of its own as Celtic. Uh, actually, Isaac Darso, you may remember him, some of you. He pronounced it Celtic Frost early on when I first joined the band. And I always thought it sounded nicer. So I generally say Celtic now. Okay. okay. Well, that, that was like an age old argument, I would think, yeah. between a lot of people. So, I mean, I personally say Celtic because I don't say Boston Celtics. When I'm talking about that, so I always say Boston Celtics. So that's what I do. Uh, like. I, so, I, I must say Celtic half the time too. So okay, so I don't feel as bad. Okay, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, what is there to say about the band? I mean, so many bands influenced, you know, 
by Celtic Frost. It's unbelievable. I mean, my band was influenced by Celtic Frost. The first time I saw them, I don't remember if you were playing, I think you were back in 87 um, with Exodus and Anthrax, I think, at yes. the Cameo Theater. Yes. I was at that show. It was awesome. I remember thinking I couldn't believe I was at the concert. You know, I think it was the first time I saw Celtic Frost. So I was like super excited about it um, and all that. I'm kind of like weirdly nervous. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. It's retail um, marks, of course. I know, I'm a little, but I, I did. I, I met you at the chance years and years ago. Um, I was on tour with Cannibal Corpse and you came to the show and I met you at the show. You were helping with the merchandise, were you? Yes. I, I remember you. Yeah, hi. <laughs> <laughs> that you was having, me. You were, having, you were having lengthy conversations with Pat. Oh, God. Let's not, uh, let's, yeah. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm just conversation. <laughs> Robin, yeah. all I'm doing is adding provenance to the story that I do remember you. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I remember meeting you and I remember you, of course. So, and I guess I'm still like, nervous i guess talking to you but any anyway um we're, i'm gonna go back to like we were talking about you know into the pandemonium and all that and i kind of feel like the same way everybody else was talking about it my curiosity like you know with everything and alex brought up also mexican radio who's just like i feel like that was such an interesting choice and back then i kind of was like huh i didn't quite understand why that was on the record yeah one thing i wanted to add too was not that it's on the record but on the record as the first song yeah it seems yeah. weird i mean i like the song actually i like the version of it but yeah it's just, it just weird odd. it's yeah. it was odd to me so like as that that time it was like huh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that's my that's my one of my questions uh that was the only time i pushed back creatively okay i i thought the, the original tune was just okay. And I didn't think it fit the band. I didn't think we could do it any justice. And, but Tom and Martin were so excited about it. And I said, all right, I'll play nice. But that was the only time I, I questioned. I said, I'm not really sure this is a good idea. And I like the way it came out recording. Yeah, I mean, it sounds good, the song. I mean, yeah. it just, it was, it was an absolute shock though when I heard yeah, it. it. I mean, at that time, it was just like, yeah. huh? Like it just yeah. came out of left, like, left field. I mean, it got a reaction, but at that time it wasn't, for me, it wasn't a good reaction. It was actually, it actually made me feel like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to like this album now, you know? It, it's not procreation of the wicked. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's slightly different, you know. But I mean, he didn't make a pretty brutal version of Mexican radio, but still, it just still seems like a strange first opening track for such an epic sounding album. It's like yeah. opposite of the whole album almost. Yeah, I just thought it was definitely. I wanted to ask about that for sure. So, and we were, we kind of touched on it. So I was kind of you know we were talking about the direction of things and all of that. And going with that, um, you know, you said that, you know, you played jazz, rock, classical training. What were your actual influences at that time when you first were getting into the band? Because it wasn't your wheelhouse, per se. Yeah, it certainly was not. Uh, I was listening to uh, electric jazz fusion. Okay. You know, almost exclusively. And then I heard, I saw Van Halen at the Monsters of Rock. And that had a huge influence on me. Motley Crue was opening and Van Halen were opening for ACDC, which I didn't stick around for. Uh, so that kind of psychologically bridged the gap, I think. Okay, so that was like, turned you into? No, it just opened my palate. Okay. Where I, where I, there was nothing, that, I didn't think there was anything there for me. But there was so much adrenaline, you know. So you knew nothing about like the new wave of British heavy metal stuff or like the early thrash stuff really before that? Correct. So you, I mean, that's actually kind of cool because you're getting a, a totally fresh, unfiltered perspective on these songs that are just. What a gift. 
it was a gift. Yeah. Because I didn't, I had no roadmap. That's kind of cool. Tom had enough faith in me to let me play and stretch out and develop. You know, I was a nothing. I mean, I had some technique, but I, I had no perspective as far as metal or, you know, priest or maiden or, you know, a venom. I wish I had been at least exposed to venom. I didn't know what Motorhead was. I saw the t-shirts. So, yeah, I wasn't influenced or I wasn't going to copy anyone per se. Awesome. That's interesting. Very, that's very yeah. like kind of unique. And like when you think about the whole genre of music, everybody has those, uh, those influences of, as well, but they have some inkling of, you know, metal in their, you know, if they're going to be in like a band, especially a band like Celtic Frost, that's just like completely, you know, super heavy and everything for back at that time, you know, am I make so. It would, yeah, it was, all, it was also compounded by the fact that I couldn't use a lot of my technique because I had to play so hard. I couldn't play a lot of the delicate, quick, complicated notes I might have normally played because those guys were just incredibly loud. <laughs> and when I went to play with Trypticon, Tom built up his martial stack fourfold. It was just a wall of abuse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that brutal sound he gets anyway, which is great. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, as far as like the songs, I mean, it's so hard to pick my top three favorites. So basically, ugh. Man, pretty much almost everything like Emperor's Return, Morbid Tales, Megatherion. I want to say possibly Innocence and Wrath into Usurper might be my, and Usurper is like my all time favorite. You know, that's good. Cool. Oh gosh. Yeah, I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to change it. Um, what would you say your favorite songs from back then were? playing wise and right as far as performing them live yeah uh three you want three okay uh circle of the tyrants the throned emperor mm. uh as challenging as it was jewel throne ah sweet see see <laughs> <laughs> But cool. as far as my personal listening, listening pleasure, I would likely only listen to things from Morbid Tales. Ironically, an album I did not play on. Okay. Do you know Stephen Priestley, the, the first drummer? Do I know him? Yeah. Quite well. He's a great guy. Okay. Cool. Super he's guy. a killer drummer as well. A great drummer and a great guy. Cool. Okay. I only have nice things to say about Steve. Oh, awesome. Anything else, Robin? Any, any stories yet before John goes? Or <laughs> no? Me? Sammy. I was wondering if he had anything else to say. Me? <laughs> uh, I think he's just an awe. Uh, uh, he's just I checking. Mean, it out. I'm a Tom story. We were on tour with Celtic Frost for the Monotheist tour. And uh, we're in St. Louis at Pops. And we were sound check with a certain song that we play that sounds a whole lot like Celtic Frost. Like a bunch of them. Um, <laughs> death grunts. So, so we got done with the song at sound check. And Tom's standing on the side of the stage. And he looks at us and goes, I should have copyrighted. <laughs> I didn't catch that. He said, "He said I should. I should have copyrighted that." As far as, <laughs> and I took that as a compliment. <laughs> cool. Awesome. That's funny. Um, okay, so um, Steve. Yay! What's up, man? <laughs> what What do you uh, What do you got to uh, say? Your top three, or yeah, I can do my top three with you. I'm gonna go with my third with the. Uh, I mean, everyone's mentioned most of these songs already tonight, of course. But uh, Jewel Throne was my number three. 
I, we actually did a, an episode on the Sea of Tranquility last year, and I didn't want to change them up too much when we had Reed on there. And I was looking back at my notes from that and into Crypt the Rays with number two. And I'm going with a circle of tyrants for number one tonight. And uh, just been an honor to have Reed on. And that was my question for Reed was what songs that he kind of liked to perform. But Robin already beat me to the punch. So I don't have too much to say other than Sorry. other than, uh, you know, my memories hanging out with Reed and going to shows like a lot of guys talking about it. The chance he would come up with me and Pardo or we'd go down to the city I can remember going to see him on a Marth with Reed once and hanging out. And uh, once at the chance, Belfagor was playing. I forget what it was one of the shows we sponsored up there. And I remember Helmut coming out and a couple of guys couldn't believe that Reed was in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, hanging out watching the show. And uh, just some great memories of hanging out with Reed, you know, back in the, in the early 2000s. I guess it was when you were around up here a lot, right? It was just as much fun for me. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you used to work in one of the local gyms around here. I believe that's where you met Pete Pardo, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. I remember uh, actually another uh, mutual friend came up to me, you know, there's a guy from this uh, heavy me you know, metal band and he works at the gym. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That's pretty much what I have to say. And, I, you know, once again, thank thank Reed for giving us his, uh, his time and joining us on the channel tonight and everyone else in the room tonight for uh, helping out with the Rock Fantasy Files. I'm totally gracious to everyone. Awesome. Um, yeah, I have a my top three um, songs, which is, it's impossible because yeah, you know, really everything for me, we'll say, we'll say, 90 per, 95 percent of everything up to into the pandemonium is almost my favorite so but i go with my third one is nocturnal fear i just love that song such a killer song yeah and then uh, two other ones were already mentioned jewel throne it's just such a good song such a such a uh, oh yeah just such a good song and then donga megiddo oh uh, yeah. That song is so epic, you know? It just has such an epic vibe to it. I just remember first hearing uh, Tomega Theron and I just was like, I, I, it would just was like so far beyond, like you just felt like you were in like a movie or some kind of, like, like the story that the band was trying to get across in the music, you just felt it, you, you know, I just totally, was, got absorbed into that album and it's really it's it's really my it's my favorite of all the celtic frost albums i mean uh morbid tales is amazing too but i just like the epic sound of um you know to make it theron just it's just it's just phenomenal um yeah i wanted to know uh, i remember my experience um i was really bummed because on the into the pandemonium tour in the u.s um the show I wanted to go to, I think it was going to be, I, I can't remember the venue, but I want to say it was probably Lemoore's, maybe Lemoore's or the Ritz. I can't remember what, what it was one of those probably, but it got canceled. And I think, the, I think actually Celtic Frost canceled midway through that tour. Is that correct? Is my memory wrong? That was 80, 87? Probably. Yeah, yeah fall, fall of 87. Yeah. Well, what happened there? I, A, don't remember, and B, if I did, I would probably attribute it to, there was some misunderstanding around that time with temporary management we had and the band. Mm -hmm. Nothing, no, no uh, animus or rancor, just misunderstanding. Okay. That's the only thing I could attribute it to, but I just don't have... I can't recall the particulars if there were any. Okay. How's that for a long answer? Yeah, I guess if you don't remember, you don't remember. I just, I remember because I was so fucking pissed. I wanted to go to show, you know, <laughs> so the show didn't happen. I was like, what the fuck, you know? Uh, and I, I, would, I would, I would remember the cancellation of a big show. That's why I'm a little bit caught uh, flat footed. Yeah. It, I'm pretty sure it was, it was Lemore's, but I mean, 
like I said, it could have been the Ritz. Those are usually the two places that I would go to. It was just convenient being from New Jersey to go, go there. And, um, yeah, I think I, I heard it. I heard it on the, like, there was a local radio station that would play like, you know, kind of like a, uh, college radio station that would tell you about all the upcoming shows. And I remember that it was like the rest of the tour got canceled for some reason. I'm, I'm surprised that you don't remember it because obviously if a tour got canceled, uh, or part of it got canceled, you would know. Well, that's my hometown market kind of thing. So that's kind of something I would remember. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. I caught that, tour, that John. tour, John. They um, they played the Tower Theater here. In, well, well, not here, but when I lived in Philly, that's where they played. Upper Barbie. And, you know, so I would think that the New York show would have been close in the routing, maybe not to the Philly show. So Usually. It's, you know, yeah, sometimes they, it's I like know they, getting an end, too. Yeah. You know, that show happened, so you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I caught that tour at the uh, the Capitol Theater in Passaic, New Jersey, in oh, December wow. of '87, and I know it also played the Mid Hudson. I'm pretty sure it played the Mid Hudson Civic Center, and I thought it played the Felt Forum. Beacon Felt Theater. Forum. Be oh, Beacon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Lamore would have been pretty small for you know those three That's, bands at that time. That I mean, yeah, I think that so. was a big that was a big tour. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I can't remember. Could, I know even in Philly, Tower Theater. You know, it's I don't know a couple thousand seater that place. So yeah, so that would have been even bigger yeah. than yeah. unless it was like two nights at Lamore's or something like bands used yeah. to do. I don't. Yeah, I mean, it was too long ago that I don't really remember the venue especially because I didn't go to it. So it even made the event remembering the venue even harder. Well, I, if I remember right, John, I thought that there was some headline dates that Frost was going to do for Into the Pandemonium. And maybe that's what got canceled because I thought I was going to catch them on a second leg. And Mm. Sorry about that. My my sound the, cut out for a second. The on my press, the, press, did the Mid Hudson Civic Center show happen? Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. it did. Okay. Like I said, I went I went to see him at the, at the Capitol. Capitol. Okay, I think I was at the Civic Center. I was usually every any metal show that was come to Poughkeepsie at that and, time period. I was in, that, at, in that tour, that tour for In the Pandemonium, the big one. Who was it? Was it was it Exodus on it that? Was, it was, it was uh, Exodus, Exodus. Exodus and Frost were on the bottom, and Anthrax was the headliner. Yeah. It was like December 87, yep. November, December, November, December, 1987. And actually, I was going to, I was going to ask how that tour was because, you know, looking back, right. That's the biggest tour that Frost ever played had to be that tour. Uh, no question. Uh, I mean, in the States. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of friction on the, on the tour bus. Uh, I mean, not, none of it carried over to the stage, but the, the mood on the bus was not optimal. There were some money problems because uh, between, again, between ban uh, management and the uh, tour director, we were having trouble getting enough funds as the tour went on for this, that, and it wasn't reliable. And I was being very cranky and unreasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. So was that tour instrumental and you guys splitting up, Reed? No, uh, it didn't help. It was a contributory factor, I think. Uh, mm. I don't think I was at my most mature or my most professional. What about the rest of the guys? Well, you know, it's interesting because Ron Marks had a unique situation. He was staying with Tom during his tenure with the band. So I can only imagine living with Tom and then coming to rehearsal. So that's another element, which I can't even imagine. I know Ron felt very frustrated. You know, he couldn't come up for air living at Tom's house, right? Yeah, yeah I understand how that could get suffocating for sure. Um, and as far as like, cause that was close to your, the time that you uh, left the band. I don't know if you left or got fired. I don't know how that worked out, but 
what was the situation between Into the Pandemonium and obviously one you want to do Cold Lake, which was a substantially different album? Oh, I had no idea that that was coming. Oh, so you, you didn't you didn't rehearse any of those songs? No, it was interesting because uh, it's not like some well, really cool version of one of those songs, a like real heavy version. <laughs> <laughs> they like just like sped it up a little bit or something. <laughs> The only thing strange was in the spring of 88, Tom invited Steve to the rehearsal room. I guess he wanted to see if Steve is interested in carrying over some of the old material or if he could play some of the, the material because they had to, Tom would have to play some of the old material on tour. Yeah. I guess he wanted to see Steve, can you play this, you know, Necromantical Screams or Jules Real, can you play this bar or whatever it is. So I found it weird that Steve came to the rehearsal room. I always liked Steve, so I didn't have any problem with it. I just it was weird that he was there. Now I understand. And then uh, I was, like I said, that whole tour prior to that, it was kind of miserable. And I guess Tom sensed it and Martin alluded that I might not be part of the new lineup. And I was kind of glad to hear it because I wanted to come home because I had yeah. such a miserable time on the tour. I just wasn't happy. It was a quality of life issue, but there was no, I had no idea he was changing the band's concept, even for just the album. That yeah. caught me. And then I understand Kurt thought he was joining the old format. Yeah. Not the revamped new album concept. So uh, that was interesting. Yeah. And Mar I mean, Martin Ain didn't make it to that, to the uh, Cole Lake album either, right? So, well, I'm sure he was not going to bind to that at all. That's just not Martin. Yeah. He co wrote a few songs on, on Cold Lake. But yeah, he didn't play on it, though, obviously. Yeah, because yeah, he because he didn't even play on Tomega Theron either, bass, I don't think, right? Right. Um, it was, I think he re recorded all the parts, but originally, no, right? It was Dominic. Oh, okay. And um, let me think. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still, I'm still fascinated on the end of the pandemonium stuff. I mean, it's just such a uh, crazy album. And what was the song? Was that uh, "I Won't Dance" song? Was that an extra song to that album? That it, I mean, because you guys did that EP, and it was like "I Won't Dance," which is kind of. I don't know. Drummond's fantastic on that song. I'll it's, tell you it's, that. it's a weird song <laughs> because it's like, it, it could be a really killer song, but I mean, for that time, I mean, backup singers in that style singing the I Won't Dance, was it? Yeah. I mean, I was just like, what the hell's going on? Like, it seemed to me like things were just lost, you know? I mean, maybe they weren't. Maybe it's part of a bigger picture. I don't understand. But, as you know, it's like the, the if you take that part out, the song's actually pretty good. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take the blame for it because uh, Tom will be the first to admit the concept for the song he had I could not grasp and I tried to play a part to accompany his guitar work as closely as I could and I wasn't getting quite getting it and the song became I guess something else so I'll take the blame for that one well did you did you was it harder for you to write the drum stuff to into the pandemonium than than uh to Megatheron and the uh, uh tragic serenades? I guess those those were to Megatheron songs mostly. No, not at all. It's just the one track. I didn't understand quite what he wanted. I think he wanted more of like a docking groove. But I don't even Maybe. know what he wanted. I mean, I don't I mean you know I what, mean Robin, you had something? Well, speaking of like this is going back and weird. I kind of remember at this show in my memory from the 87 tour that Tom came out and he wasn't wearing his, you know, pictures. You see him in like, you know, all black and everything. And he was wearing a white docking shirt. Uh -huh. Oh, there you go. I remember like for some reason, yeah, I was like, that sticks in my brain. I mean, didn't, I mean, didn't that seem weird to you? I mean, Reed, you know, being in a band with him and seeing this, kind of change because as far as I, I mean I don't know for sure the um I wasn't there I've I've heard 
through uh, different sources throughout the years that, you know, somewhere between into the pandemonium, uh, you know, and on, or maybe a little bit before, he was kind of changing his influences a lot and kind of wanting to really push into that more uh, commercial uh, way. And I even heard that it might've been influenced by his girlfriend or something like that at the time. I'm not really being a hundred percent sure I've, it's all secondhand information or third hand or who knows could be rumor. But I mean, was that something that you noticed that there was just outside influences that were kind of pushing him into trying to be uh, fit in with these yeah bands like Dokken and whatever, you know, which just is ridiculous in my opinion. Honestly. Uh, I, I, I like Dokken. I'm sorry, go ahead. I like Dokken, so I, I don't <laughs> not that I don't like Dokken, but I don't want to, you know, Celtic Frost. I don't want to hear Celtic Frost. No, it's playing. too different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not love is not the song I want to hear by Celtic Frost. Just like no. I I really didn't want to hear uh, I won't dance by Celtic Frost. You know, I was kind of bummed out when I heard that. I was like, you could have just changed the course to something a little cooler and I wouldn't have minded, you know? Sure. Uh Girlfriend influence, uh, that was a little after me, but I think it was kind of noticeable. Yeah. Um, for better or for worse. I mean, we're all human, right? Yeah, of course. But still, uh, it just see, it seems weird because maybe it was a little bit out of his own, um, you know, personal pocket. I mean, it's not for me to say what direction someone's supposed to go, but it just did not seem like you know, after putting out probably, you know, and to me, to Megatheron is like the heaviest album ever. And to just kind of go, okay, the experimental thing and into the pandemonium was ex acceptable, but then, you know, obviously it went too far in Cold Lake. I think, I think uh, Tom's woman at the time might, maybe I'm speculating, might've had more of an influence on Cold Lake. Uh, into the pandemonium, not so much. I don't feel I think yeah. he just wanted, I think musically he wanted to stretch out more. And well, it, it comes more in context now when once you hear, uh, was it the album that he did in the 2000s? You could tell that he wanted to go more kind of, I don't know, you call it gothic -y or whatever kind of sound to it. So it makes sense totally, you know? But at that time, it was just, it was still a little shock. I mean, even though I do like Into the Pandemonium, at the time it, it was, it was one that I, I just put aside for a little while. I, you know, like like Alex, you know, I heard, um, you know, Wall of Voodoo cover, and it was just like, uh, you know, we're just on the wrong page here. You know, well, think I, about I, it. You have like the artist hitting drummer in metal, and you come to him and you say like, hey, do you want to play some Wall of Voodoo? <laughs> if I would be Reed, I would be like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. That's what I'm trying to get out of you, Reed. <laughs> I want you to be like, what the fuck are you guys thinking? <laughs> I, 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 but I did. That's like I said, that's the only time I pushed back. Well, I totally understand you, brother. <laughs> I, I said, are you sure this is a, you want to do this tune? But they were Tom and Martin were on the same page, and they were well, really excited about it. Well, from your opinion, what were they thinking? <laughs> I mean, you'd um, know better than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I know Martin. Martin listened to other things also. Jesus, Mary yeah. Chain, Sisters of Mercy. You know, he listened to other types. You know, not just metal, so to speak. Yeah. Well, was there any other um, songs that were in the wheelhouse of possibly covering besides that? Well, the Dean Martin time? song I thought was good too. That was cool. Awesome. Wow. Was totally awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's something Fucking Martin heavy. Wanted to do. Yeah. But no, uh, no other songs. You guys kind of made it your own, you know, those songs. Mm -hmm. and, you know, even Mexican radio, it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah. you know, it's, you, you kind of made it your own thing, you know, which is, I think is interesting when bands do covers and they kind of put their own stamp on things, but, you know. Mexican radio, it, it seems like an expansion on what was this? What was the song that had the dance mix on the Tragic Serenades? Um, um, 
Oh no, you took it. Uh, was it Return to the Eve? And Reed, you sang yeah, on that too, yeah, I believe, right? Yeah, Return to the Eve dance mix. I just didn't understand. I'm like, I know. I mean, it's kind no, of. No, that's funny. not a dance mix. That's a, it's just it's just. It's a party mix. I know oh, what you're talking about. Oh, it was a party mix. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I was just like, I don't, I don't know. Do I really need a Celtic Frost party mix? I'm just, I just want to hear the Celtic <laughs> Frost song. Every song is a party for me at Celtic Frost, you know. But it just seemed like kind of a little bit weird. Um, I was just listening to it before, and I mean. I'm used to it now, but yeah, at the time too, it was also, it was a, almost a little bit of a turnoff, you know? I know I sound like I'm terrible. I like bashing everything that Celtic Frost did, but yeah. really I love Celtic Frost. And there's you're, so much that's great. I only do it, say it because I care so much about the band, you know? I think you're referring to uh, One in Their Pride, John. I think that's what you're talking about. One in it, yeah, that that was the B-side to uh, I, I Won't, won't dance. dance. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. I was like really bummed out about because just like, I got, I got, you're giving me hardly anything on this album, you know, it's like, I mean, the riff, the riff and I won't dance is pretty cool. The drumming's good. The bass, but I mean, it, those lyrics were a little rough on that. And, and then, yeah, then the one, one in your pride, is it the, is the dance It's pretty, not dance, but it's like a techno song, which too, I mean, I'm, I'm an elitist. So, you know, it wasn't my thing, you know, when I heard that, I was just like, okay. So to have like an intro or an outro on the side too, you know? Yeah, it's not Fear Factory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, other bands it would make total sense doing something like that. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't understand it at the time. But then, you know, I guess well, that song was also on uh, Into the Pandemonium too, and it, you know, Into the Pandemonium definitely had more of the uh, experimental songs. I'd say. Oh, decidedly, uh, the record company came to the studio. Uh, Mid session, and they were. Carl was very upset. You know, he wanted something more like straight destruction or creator. Yeah. One mm. of his other. And so he was. He was very nervous. Yeah. Well, overall, I mean, how did the album do for you guys on your side of it? Was it? Did it sell well? I mean, it probably sold well just because people were super excited to get it. But do you think it sold well on its own, or sold well because um, you know? of the band's legacy at that time. Well, I lost you for a second. Part up to itself. It'll never be a To Make a Theory or a Morbid Tales. Yeah. Yeah, I sold quite a few copies of that when it came out for sure. It was a steady seller right through that catalog. And, yeah. I, mean, I mean, musically more than sales wise. I don't think it, I don't think it could keep up with no. More no. no, 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 not at all. It's just a totally different album. Like I said, I mean, it has its moments, I think, that are really great on it. Some are, I mean, I could do without, you know, certain parts of the album. I, I mean, I understand it's a little more experimental, just, you know, out of the, you know, I, I kind of have, for me, it's kind of like Morbid Tales, uh, it's Megatheron, and, um, you know, Into the Pandemonium. Into the Pandemonium is definitely the third in line of the, you know of those three or whatnot but um okay well any other questions so it's, I, don't, I really don't want to talk about all the parts of songs i don't like when there's so many nah. songs, parts i do like those songs <laughs> <He's> a harsh <laughs> critic <laughs> i do have another question for reed um when you guys came to montreal you came with andy segris um <laughs> amazing guy he was your manager at the time any news from him have you talked to him at all like no, zero on my part. Uh, the fellows from the early days, I think, just sort of dispersed. No, Andy Seagreis, no. He, he took some early photos. I just found a black and white photo that he took. I think it was the third day I was in the band or something. Wow. Um, he was an amazing yeah. guy. We really liked him. Yeah, yeah. I do have to say those, those Celtic Frost uh, band photos, you guys always look killer. It just always looked killer. It just you looked at you you looked at the pictures. You're just like, damn, these fuckers are crazy. You know, just well, that, that's the thing. The the image reflected the music. You tell yeah. it was well thought out. Yeah. I thought I thought the camera in that the camera loved Martin. I thought, yeah. and those early the early Hell, Hellhammer photos. Tom, his look. Wow. <laughs> Actually, Reed, I just thought about something a lot of people probably don't know, but you uh, briefly got back 
and worked with Tom. I think it was in the early nineties and you guys did some recordings, I yeah. believe some demos. And right. uh, so like, what, what happened with that? Oh, that went very well. Uh, he was working with Kurt down in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. went down for five weeks. It was fabulous. And we did rehearsals and recording and I was really interrupting the recordings and changing some of the bass and guitar part which I never wow. did before. Um, thought it was the greatest thing ever. He goes, why didn't you do that when you were in the band? You should have been more creative. Like, you, be, you have to contribute more to the writing. You should see you wasted all that time. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys ever discussed re releasing any of that material? Or? I don't know what became of the recordings. Okay. I have some, if I can find the cassettes, I will share them. Brad. Is that from 1993? <laughs> Yeah. December, December of 92. 92. Okay. Cause you yeah, have a, I have a bootleg CD. Um, I, there's a name, there's a name of it. It's like power something, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. Nemesis of power. Yeah, Nemesis I of power. yeah. I have, I, I have it, I have it somewhere in my collection. What kind of style is it? Is it like old frost or. It remind it reminded me almost of the sound of vanity nemesis. Oh, sweet. Okay. A little, a little bit. Mm -hmm. It was heavy, it, but musical. Cool. I think it's really interesting um, with Tom's entire career, especially knowing the guy. You know, I asked him about Hellhammer, and he, he basically told me that everyone hated it. Like, everyone hated it. He said that Kerrang said they were the worst band in the world. And the guy continues on, you know. And he, you know, Celtic Frost and does this, which funny enough, he told me was uh, really influenced by Discharge, which I thought was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he keeps going with that. Uh, now, like whether or not you, you know, get into the pandemonium or not, I mean, he's continuing to do what the guy wants to do. And then Cold Lake, I mean, even he, I asked him a question. I was like, I got a question for you guys. Don't ask me about the Cold Lake. So I mean, even he probably understands, you know, that everybody didn't get it. And then on to Vanity Nemesis, which to me, being the smart ass I am, I'll, I'll look over at him and be like, so uh, Tom, do you like Christian Death? And I'm I'm being a fucker because he sounds like Roz Williams on that album all over it. The point is, what's really fascinating about the band we're all here to talk about today is it seems that for better or worse, the guy just does exactly what in the fuck he wants to do. Yeah. And had he not done that, I mean, we wouldn't have had Hellhammer and we wouldn't have had Celtic Frost. So even for the records that like, and I, I agree with pretty much everything John said about these things. And it's, I'm sitting here laughing because, you know, uh, you know, I, I didn't honest. Uh, cover. <laughs> I didn't understand it, but, um, and then to come back full circle and, and, you know, do monotheist and do Trypticon, which I mean, to me, I, is some of the heaviest music in the world. And I promise you, if you've seen it live. I, I mean, it is devastating, you know, um, I think the guy deserves the credit for it. And I think you would all probably agree that just the fact yeah. that we'll do exactly what the fuck they want to do for better or worse well, is really good. Yeah. And, and probably how a lot of us even are able to play extreme music. So I think it's really cool. Well, I agree with you, Jared, hundred yeah. percent. I mean, any band, any person should really do what they want to do musically, regardless of what other people think, just because I was I was not musically mature whatsoever at that time in, in the eighties. I'm really not musically mature now, but back definitely <laughs> back then I wasn't, and I didn't understand any like a lot of that stuff was just way over my head, you know, and it hit, hit me the wrong way. And I mean, certain certain things, yeah, I still don't understand, but you know, uh, definitely Tom Warrior always just did what he wanted to do, and. Anybody that's a musician that writes music, you know, I think, you know, respects that or wants to be that with the stuff that they write. They want to just do what they want to do and, you know, be able to tell the world to piss off if you don't like it. And, you know, you have the choice to say, OK, you know, I think this, you know, idea sucks or whatever. But, you know, you can't fault the guy for doing whatever he thought was right at that time, regardless well, if it sounds insane, you know. You know, I, I think I could speak for all of us here that are musicians at one time, especially when we all started, uh, including, you know, Reed even before us is, uh, <clears throat> you know, we were not the cool thing on the block, you know, and 
you know, but we were just playing music that was honest, you know, and I think that's the thing about Frost. I mean, you think about the chances that, uh, especially with Into the Pandemonium, you know, especially at that time, that was just, there was nothing like it, you know? And um, so, you know, I really, uh, my respect, you know, to, to the three of you guys who made that record, um, you know, there, like I said, there was, there was nothing like that, especially being established at that time. Because, you know, in, in, the, in the mid and late eighties, you know, being in the underground, the extreme metal scene was extremely elitist, you know, like me and John were part of the same uh, scene and uh, we were probably one of the most elitist people <laughs> around and and uh, but where I'm getting at is to you know to the the um, the honesty and just to the chances of making that record you know I can't imagine what you guys were thinking then it's just like you know and, and just uh, the diversity of that record but even saying that it's it's a it's a very diverse record but at the same time it's an extremely dark album you know I and, just to in, and, sorry to uh, interrupt but this part i mean that album there's a lot of songs out there that create their own genre of metal now it's insane i mean sure. you would never yeah, have thought, i never would have thought about it then but now totally yep yeah and, 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 and as a kid i was a, a you know besides you know i didn't tell a lot of my friends in uh the scene but you know secretly secretly i liked a lot of like new wave music and stuff like that and you know at, in those days it was like kill posers and all that kind of stuff and, yeah and uh <clears throat> you know so if i told my friend that i liked uh, the cure or something like that he'd probably kick my ass in, in uh, 1987 <laughs> but uh you know but where i'm getting at it like i said is just the the, the honesty of that and it's just you know like uh, jared was talking about you know with, with tom it's just like you know that's the thing, you know, you know, to be true is to just be honest with yourself and, and, and make the music that you want to hear. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't do that, you know, so kudos to, uh, to you three who made that record. Well, thank you. I know that uh, Tom and Martin knew that everything else was already out there. That was becoming homogenous and, you know, introducing opera singers. Now I hear it all the time. Uh, horns, timpani, uh, you know, that's something we really wanted to integrate uh, to show that the band was not just two dimensional. Yeah. Um, and for me, one last question for you just, I don't know, just tell us something about that time that, you know, would be a cool story for us to hear, just something about, you know, either the recording or touring or shows, just, just something badass. I'd love to hear it. There are so many, of course, few come to mind now, but recording to Megatherion was a very magical experience because we were living and recording in what was then West Berlin. West Berlin at the time oh, was yeah. all in the city, in the middle of East Berlin, which is yeah. completely socialist, communist. And around the city of Berlin, by the wall, the wall was everywhere, they would have every couple of blocks, they'd have a tower where you'd go up and look over into the east and you'd see how the people live there. And it was, wow. it was astonishing. Now to get from West Germany to Berlin by car, you have to travel through East Germany. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and you, there's, you enter East Germany, there's a big Russian tank there up on the a big concrete plinth and they take your passports and 100 meters down the road, they give them back to you. They were on a conveyor belt and you see the cars they're driving, these little boxes. And you could see the little people in these little boxy cars looking at the Mercedes from the West driving by them. And it was just oh. such a stark reminder of where you were. But it got a little, a little scary. And every once in a while you'd see the secret police van with little radar spinning on its roof. And finally we get to Berlin after hours on one of Hitler's old Autobahns, the Reich's Autobahn. And there's three flags, a French flag, a British flag, and American flag. And it says in big letters, Allied Checkpoint, Bravo. And what a relief. And you realize, wow, you're in a different world now. You're back in the West, so to speak. And to be in Berlin at the time of having the wall around you uh, really affected 
the recording I feel in some way and living in Berlin. I don't think that if we recorded that album in Los Angeles, it would have had that flavor. Mm. If that makes any sense. No, yeah. totally. 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 I mean, I've, I've been to Berlin, not, it was after the wall came down, but still it was really, you know, a few years afterwards. And you could still tell totally that it's two different worlds. You know, I could just imagine it, it back in the eighties to be there and to see that would just be, um, you know, mind blowing, life changing, you know? Yeah. That's pretty heavy. Like yeah. you hear that. Yeah. yeah. It makes you, you know, makes you appreciate things once you see a reality like that, you know, it makes you appreciate what you have, but, um, that's, that's an awesome story. Thank you. And, um, I guess before we, uh, you know, call it a day with the show, is there any last comments or any questions or anything anybody would like to add? Which tour did you have all the, the high heels all over your drum set? Which tour was that? I was going to ask that one. I forgot. Good, good <laughs> oh, uh, I guess all of them. All of them. Okay. I Where they get the shoes from? <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. What was that? Where did you get, where the, did you get the shoes from? The girls used to throw them at me. Uh-huh. Okay. And I had my drum tech put them on a coat hanger. <laughs> <laughs> were, they, right. were, they different, were they different shoes every night? Like that many? Uh, yeah. I had four sets. <laughs> Why shoes? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. What, what, what happened to the rest of their clothes? <laughs> uh, Robin, I didn't know you blushed. <laughs> Robin blushing. I might. I'm like, what? Uh, I'm did so you ever confused. throw? Did you ever throw shoes at Reed? Uh, I never I threw my shoes at Reed. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've never told you again. <laughs> like, I just don't understand the shoes. I'm I'm perplexed. I saw Tom uh, getting hit by a shoe once and not being happy about it. Oh. <laughs> oh, I bet. Who would be? <laughs> Who'd want to get hit by a shoe? We used, to rehearse in a we used to rehearse in a bunker, a bomb shelter. Oh, yeah. A nuclear bomb shelter. I don't know if you knew that. You uh, oh. talked about that on the on Pardo's episode. I found that quite interesting. Maybe uh, close up the show and talking a little bit about that bunker. Yeah, we rehearsed in a nuclear bomb shelter when I joined the band. And where was that? Outside of Zurich in the Swiss countryside. Oh, okay. And it had a big door that weighed about four tons and it took forever to close and it had big rubber gaskets and a big handle to seal it shut so no one could hear what we were doing. It was very dark in there. We had, we had some colored lights and this and that. But at the time I was dating a girl, she was very flamboyant and she had a pair of white high heels. And they got a scratch on one of them. So she was going to throw them out. I said, give, give those to me. I'm going to do something with them. So I put one on each bass drum. Because the drums were black. The guitars were black. The stage was black. Just to brighten up the room a little bit. And I just put them on. And then the shoes started flying. We went on the first tour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. so, the, wow. so basically, you have to instigate shoes on like the gear. And then... Chicks will just start it's, throwing shoes at you. I'll have to, I'll have to remember that. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Nah, that's funny. That's awesome. Okay, well, um, I mean, I, I guess it was, thank you very much for being on the yeah. show, Ree. It's been totally awesome. Oh, go ahead. One, a little surprise for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Who remembers a photo of Tom in Hellhammer with a, with a sword, holding a sword? Yeah. I've seen that. There it is. Wow. Nice. Awesome. Before I left for the States for the last time, Tom gave it to me. Cool. Nice. That's very cool. That's awesome. super cool. Yeah. yeah. Under my bed. <laughs> this is one of the, the same from the That's awesome. Is that cool? Hell yeah. Like it. That's awesome. Hell yeah. Well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank all you guys for being here. Uh, Alex, yeah. Sammy, you know, Robin, Jared, um, Denny, um, 
Chris, really appreciate it. Of course, Steve, you want to take us out, Steve? Because I always forget to say the proper stuff at the end. Anyway, That's so all right. I might it. forget too. I'm uh, a little out of it today for some reason. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in tonight and the Rock Fantasy Files. And we were trying something new tonight. Uh, John was actually broadcasting his live through his Facebook uh, channel, the Incantation Facebook channel, correct, John? Oh, it's through my personal one, but... Oh, through the personal one. Okay, so people were watching along, which is our first uh, actual live uh, version, and uh, it was an honor having Reed back on. I consider Reed a friend of Rock Fantasy over the years. Of course, he used to live here in the Hudson Valley with us, as we mentioned earlier, and of course, Sammy from Gohor, another great friend of Rock Fantasy, got to hang out with us at the old shop, and Alex, and everyone else, and Chris Allo, one of my best friends, and Will. Will is the first guest ever on Rock Fantasy Files, so he's always going to be famous. But uh, please forget <laughs> to uh, subscribe to the channel if you could. Hit like, and uh, please mention your favorite Celtic Frost songs, your favorite Celtic Frost moments, and uh, all that stuff. And thank you. Thank Keep you so much. Thanks, guys.